Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the RSK Biosensors First Thursday Club. Um, feels like a particularly spring-like day today. I'm going to make a claim for the first swallow, um, although I think the expression is one swallow doesn't make a summer, does it? So perhaps I need to see another one. Those of people might have noticed that it's April the 1st today, but as it's after 12 o'clock, you can not expect any uh, April Fool's jokes. Um, today we're going to hear from Matthew Davison. Um, he's a, an aquatic ecologist within, within RSK Biosensus, and he's going to be talking about uh, the winds of change, an aquatic ecologist guide to round four. Um, but before I hand over to, to Matt, I'll just do some housekeeping. Uh, for those of you that have been to these before, you'll, you'll be familiar with this, but just for the benefit of those that haven't, um, throughout the presentation, your mic microphones will be muted. Um, but you can ask questions using the question uh, box on, on the control panel there. Um, feel free to just pop them in as Matt's talking. Um, I'll be looking through them and sorting them out so we can have a Q&A at the end. Um, so please ask questions there. Um, after the presentation, we'll be emailing out a, a feedback form uh, questionnaire. So it would be great if you could take time to fill that in. It helps us refine what we're doing here. Um, but yeah, before that, I, would, I should introduce our speaker for today. Um, Matthew is a graduate of the University of the Wales, of Wales, Bangor. Um, he's now a principal aquatic ecologist here at RSK Biosensors. He's been working in environmental consultancy for 15 years, during which time Matthew has been involved in several nationally significant infrastructure projects, including Hornsey Offshore Wind Farm, Nig Bay Harbour Developments, and the proposed Moorside Nuclear Power Station. He is a specialist fish ecologist and routinely authors technical reports, baseline characterizations, and environmental statements. Matthew has worked extensively throughout the UK and abroad. And I will now hand over to Matthew. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. So for the purpose of the presentation, I'm going to uh, turn off my webcam and I'll be back on later for the uh, QA. So for those of you, uh, thank you first of all, Tim, for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, and for those who are unfamiliar with RSK, um, just a quick uh, introduction to the business, a bit of marketing. Um, RSK is a leading environmental engineering and technical services business uh, consisting of over 80 businesses employing over 5,500 employees in over 30 countries and is supporting 7,500 clients. Uh, we work on land, sea and air to deliver a client-focused service. Um, RSK Biosense has formed part of the, the wider group. We employ uh, over 100 full-time staff and have the assistance of 700 plus technical experts. We offer an ecological service that incorporates a dedicated aquatic consultancy. Um, of the services we include, we have both desk-based, so scope and feasibility, environmental impact assessment, habitat regulations assessment, etc. And also survey services, and um, so fisheries population studies, invertebrate sampling, habitat mapping, protected species. And um, so to summarise, that's a, a brief marketing for, for RSK. So uh, moving on, we'll make a start with the presentation. So today, as you know, we're going to be talking about offshore wind. So in the first instance, uh, a brief history um, on where we're up to, uh, and it'll bring us right to date. And then we'll be moving on to uh, my experience from working in round three. Um, my thoughts on round four and then future applications. Um, and I should just point out that I am a fish and shellfish ecologist. So today's talk will be heavily biased in that regard. Um, but many of the points I'll make are hopefully be applicable to, to different chapter areas um, and different assessment areas, such as benthic ecology, marine mammals, uh, seabirds, etc. So, offshore wind. So, in 2000, uh, the Blythe Offshore Wind Farm was installed as a demonstrator project. Uh, this was followed by, uh, in 2003, the North Hoyle Wind Farm, which became the first commercial operation. Uh, and in the same year, um, the round two seabed leasing results were announced by the Crown Estate. In 2007, uh, the government announced that a strategic environmental assessment was to be undertaken in support of round three developments. It's also worth noting that in 2008, um, the UK surpassed Denmark as a global leader in offshore wind. 
Then in 2003, Thanet became the world's largest offshore wind farm. And in addition, the round three winners were announced. In 2017, the first round three development became operational, which is Rampion, which I'm uh, glad to say that RSK actually delivered the impact assessment for. And then in 2019, Hornsey Project One became the first one gigawatt project. And again, this is a project I'm uh, very familiar with as I worked as a fish and shellfish ecologist to deliver the ES chapter. Um, I also undertook the, the baseline characterization surveys uh, and that included the, the benthic ecology assessments as well. So moving on, what's the, uh, the next step for offshore wind here in the UK? Well, offshore wind is regarded a, a, as a critical source for renewable energy and will form an important part of the government's 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. Um, this has resulted in an uplifted projection from 30 to 40 gigawatts by 2030. It's a, a pretty ambitious plan. Um, and in this sense, we already generate uh, a large amount of the, um, the offshore wind power uh, in the, on a global scale. Um, it's also important to note that the of the 40 gigawatts to be generated, one gigawatt will be delivered um, from the innovative um, floating offshore wind known as FLOW. Uh, we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail as we go through the presentation. And then bring this right up to date. Um, in February 2021, this year, um, the offshore wind leasing for round four tender process was concluded resulting in the selection of six proposed new offshore wind projects in the waters around England and, the, and Wales. Um, three have been sited on the northeast coast within the Central North Sea, and three have been sited on the northwest coast within the Celtic Sea. Uh, six projects selected have now progressed through the bidding process and now at stage four. So stage four, or the plan level habitat regulations assessment stage, uh, will be undertaken before awarding the seabed rights. And this process will basically involve, uh, this process will then move into the fifth and final stage, known as the agreement release, which is due for completion in spring 2022, so not a million miles away. And then finally, um, the both projects will add approximately eight gigawatts to the national grid, which is enough to deliver electricity to more than seven million homes. So that's a, a brief summary of, of the, of the uh, offshore wind in the UK past, present, and we'll get to future a little bit later on. So we'll move on to, to my experience working in, in round three. At this point, I should say, just put a shameless selfie in there. But I've got 10 years experience of working in uh, offshore renewables. Um, that includes obviously projects like uh, Hornsey, as we already mentioned, Navitus Bay, but also demonstrated projects uh, such as Mithil. Um, and I've also been involved in other areas of renewable energy, such as wave and tidal energy, so Swansea and, and Cardiff Bay Tidal Lagoon projects. Um, and in that regard, um, I've worked both in the field and from a desk-based perspective. Um, so field perspective, delivery and, and design and delivery of, of surveys. So again, uh, mainly from a fisheries perspective, both um, trawling or intertidal multi-methods, such as uh, seine netting, but also um, benthic, such as grab sampling, uh, drop down video, et cetera. And then from a, a desk based perspective, um, technical reporting, position statements, environmental assessments, um, stakeholder engagement, um, those sort of areas. Um, so essentially, what are my lessons learned? Well, firstly, as it is April the 1st, that is obviously. Well, hopefully those who are awake, that is Mark Warburg and there's my ugly mug. So uh, that's a, a true offshore operative right there. The best looking one of the two, I think. And uh, we'll go into the project design and sort of get rid of that cringe weariness. So uh, project design is the, so yeah, so essentially um, it's an unseen environmental engineering constraints that always crop up uh, at, at the project engineering stage. So essentially um, from a, from a previous example, such as Navitas Bay, um, there was a the array was was developed, designed, and and was assessed. 
And then we encountered issues from a land and visual perspective, which resulted in the turbine array being uh, amended on several occasions, necessitating the need for additional uh, sampling, uh, which had a, a knock-on effect in terms of timings. Um, so again, that evolution of, of design process um, requires a high degree of flexibility. So uh, by that, I mean, you should always aim to undertake a worst case scenario approach, i.e. Rochdale. That way you build in a degree of redundancy um, and you can incorporate or, or accommodate any, any changes. By that, you should also aim to um, support the project engineering team. There are always going to be instances whereby um, the best available technology or engineering practices may have effects on, in this instance, fish and shellfish. They need to be made aware of those, discussed, and if possible, um, incorporate inherent design to mitigate that before the need for actual um, active mitigation is required. Um, and to do this, it's 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 best to engage with the relevant stakeholders, so non-statutory and statutory, as early on in the process as possible. Um, and this way, it will give you the means of identifying uh, any concerns um, and incorporating them into the assessment stage. So moving on, so we're just going to briefly touch upon uh, the guidance for, for round three and, and what we used. Um, mainly um, CFAS publication, and that related specifically to fish and shellfish ecology. But there are also other documents such as OSPAR, uh, another CFAS one which actually updated that from 2004 to 2012, and of course SAIM, which at the time was, I think it was the 2010 edition, but was later updated in 2018. These all focus or have elements of fish and shellfish ecology or touch upon um, the impact assessments or the, the relevant effects that we need to be considered within the assessment or provide uh, detail in terms of the, the methodology to be used during the assessment stage in the baseline. Study area, uh, I found again from past experience, this can always be uh, a difficult one to sort of pin down early in the process. So um, due to those, those issues and the evolution of the design, um, it's often the case that the, um, the turbine array uh, will vary in size or the cable route. There may be multiple cable route um, options as well as multiple, um, which would basically result in multiple landfall um, options being uh, needed to be considered. So in that regard, and from a shell, fish and shellfish perspective, again, um, it's important to remember that fish are in a highly mobile receptor. So it's not just looking at the, the zone of influence that borders the array or the export cable route. It's also worth considering the, the wider regional sea areas. And by that, you then need to define what those right regional sea areas will be. And to do that, you're going to have to uh, consult with um, modelers. And, and in this respect, underwater noise, suspended sediment concentrations, they can they can encompass areas up to you know, tens of kilometers from the from the actual array. So it's important that when you when you're looking at the mobility of the species or the receptor, you factor in your modeled outputs, and then that will give you a pretty robust assessment in terms of zone of influence and the wider regional area which we'll need to incorporate. So the baseline characterization. Well, it's typically uh, two approaches, as with any baseline. So desk-based review, which will be um, data, uh, data-driven or literature-driven that's, you know, that's already out there and available, um, but also where are any concerns or gaps in knowledge, survey. So from that respect, um, it's important to undertake a, a robust data mining exercise uh, and make your requests um, with the relevant um, authorities, so MMO via uh, CFAS or um, the Environment Agency, for example, if looking at migratory fish species. Um, and that way, you should also be aware that there are turnaround times associated with this. Um, so make those early in the process. They can be 
days if not weeks before that data comes in and you are dependent on that to to assess your baseline uh, and from that you've got to generate um your gap analysis which will then determine the need for to survey as we've, we've sort of touched upon a moment ago um but yeah the baseline itself needs to be as as robust as, as possible so you need to consider all factors you need to look at um, spawning areas uh, nursery uh, foraging grounds uh, crustacean uh, overwintering areas uh, commercial species species of conservation importance and air and protected areas so make sure you cover all your bases so survey options so this is a an area that i'm particularly interested in i, I initially started off working out uh, on on survey predominantly um again from the fishery side um so a lot of offshore work as well uh, and when it comes to offshore wind um the the first port of call is usually trawling uh, and when i say trawling mainly demersal trawling so demersal trawling is a form of bottom trawling um, and that will incorporate both uh, two and four meter beam trawls as well as uh, otter trawl specifically for for ground fish such as cod or your flat fish such as place um, re less routinely, you might want to consider pelagic trawls, so midwater trawls, but they would pick up uh, different species assemblages such as sprat and herring um, that wouldn't otherwise be picked up within the, within the demersal trawls. Um, it's also worth noting that two meter beam trawls, um, a lot of the data can be uh, derived from benthic ecology assessments. So you can piggyback on, on the benthic ecology chapter uh, and, and not necessarily need to undertake dedicated two meter beam in as part of the fisheries process instead just focus on either four meter, to, four meter beam or otter or combinations of, of the two. But I should just say also that the uh, demersal trawling as well gives you a, a very broad range of, of species that it incorporates so um, from ground fish all the way up to sometimes midwater as well and it will also give you anecdotal data in terms of uh, mobile shellfish. Um, so that would be completely missed if you if you just focus on pelagic only. Shellfish, well, from my experience, you can pretty much characterize shellfish by looking at the uh, the commercial landings data, and that can be requested from the the MMO and Marine Management Organisation. However, there is a flaw in that in that it doesn't tell you uh, information on on juveniles or or discards. So you can commission a dedicated logbook recording schemes uh, whereby um, the commercial operators will essentially, or a number of commercial operators will, will give you details of their catch uh, and they should, or they can take notes on, on your behalf for, for discards. Um, but to ground truth that, it's always worth um, considering the use of uh, dedicated fisheries observers and they can be uh, placed on board a vessel for that purpose and just do a, a physical count of of return versus uh, discard targeted sampling well as you say the uh, demersal and otter trawl is uh, is a biased process all all sampling is is biased to, to some extent um but when you're considering uh receptors such as sand deal or herring you want to make sure that your your data incorporates that if there isn't sufficient data available uh, and and you're not going to generate that from 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 sampling using your your standard techniques then you may need to consider going uh, and and using a, a targeted approach and that would in in the sand deals instance um utilize dredges but also um for herring for example uh, spawning grounds uh, drop down video um diver uh, Cyclone sonar, uh, grabbing it can all be used to, to ground truth that. And there are new techniques that, that we didn't use at the time for, for round three, but eDNA is also starting to come online. And uh, we'll touch on that briefly later on. Intertidal, so this predominantly uh, applies to where the cable makes landfall. Uh, and this is especially applicable in estuaries or areas where you've got large uh, intertidal areas. So sand flats, mud flats, for example, that are used for spawning, refuge, nursery. Um, to do that, um, it's recommended that you follow the water framework directives, a WFD track approach uh, of a multi-method. Um, so small seine nets, uh, scientific beam trawling, static netting, uh, push netting. Um, these are all excellent techniques, um, but can be 
quite time consuming and also you need to consider seasonal aspects as with any fisheries to lose as well. So again, there are there are new methods coming online uh, such as um, broads, so beta remote underwater video, uh, in addition to eDNA, as we've already mentioned. And then finally, migratory fish. So this is uh, important to consider where there are freshwater influences within your study area. Um, and migratory fish obviously are going to be present at various abundances at, at different times of year. Um, I'm not aware of any um, dedicated offshore migratory fish study being undertaken um, for round three. Uh, the only instance where I've been aware of that is for um, the Tan Lagoon projects, um, we used to track and trace study. Um, mainly migratory fish are characterised via um, depth based studies. So, moving on, looking at the effects. So, we always in standard approach to uh, any any assessment from from a construction development perspective is to consider construction, operation, decommissioning, as well as cumulative and in combination effects. So, what are the, what are the typical uh, effects for for offshore development, offshore wind developments? Well, mainly underwater noise and vibration. Uh, suspended sediment concentration was another big one in the past. Um, and I think these are going to be applicable again in the future. Electromagnetic field uh, you know, a decade ago was also a, a, a bit of a consideration, but as we'll, we'll, we'll see slightly later, um, EMF has been mitigated predominantly via inherent design features. So the impact assessment stage. So it's, uh, as you've mentioned, modeling is, a, is an important aspect to assess any uh, receptor and to gauge uh, where those effects are going to come from uh, and that would be you know useful to define not only the study area but also um, your interaction with known spawning grounds nursery areas foraging grounds etc and um, also the um the nature of the engineering that's going to be taking place. Uh, so in that regard, again, from, from around three perspective, um, the big one was monopile versus gravity base. So in this in this sense, we're talking about the foundation. So a monopile is a single point um, took a relatively small footprint on the seabed, but required uh, percussive piling techniques, which obviously generated a an excessive amount of underwater noise and vibration, which is a consideration for a lot of fish species, predominantly herring or shad, which again is a level of protection associated with. But gravity based, um, these are much larger um, footprint on the seabed, but as a near silent technique for installation. So the concern there was from a uh, an impact to seabed and a direct, you know, a net loss of habitat essentially, which would, you know, foraging again um, and also spawning habitat. Um, as I briefly mentioned, so the interray uh, and export cable um, generates electromagnetic field and heat emissions. Uh, at the time, these were found to be a concern for electromagnetic species such as elasmobranchs, so shark skates and rays, but also for salmonids. So uh, salmon and sea trap that, that uh, use that application for navigation. But with the onset of, of cable burial techniques, so down to a depth of about 1.5 meters or uh, suitable armoring, so steel armoring, um, those uh, effects are, are dampened and are, and are mitigated. Uh, it's also important to consider, as you've already mentioned, freshwater influences. Um, again, just expanding on that slightly so freshwater influences where you've got the cable routes are usually making landfall in or around an estuarine environment um, or where they cross uh, an estuary which obviously has a, a freshwater influence com uh, component associated with that uh, and this is going to be particularly important uh, as we saw um, previously for the Celtic Sea region you know if you've got uh, the D estuary for example is a big one there and it's uh, it has um, and it's to salmon uh, associated with that as a, as a qualifying feature for the SAC. So that is going to be need to be picked up during the assessment stage. What are the typical constraints from 
from the run through developments that, that I picked up on. Um, well, uh, location wise, um, protected uh, and sensitive areas, as we've already mentioned, so spawning, nursery foraging again, all these all these applications that need to be considered. This this may have a bearing on um, where the array is going to be sited, how the cable route comes in, is it going to dog leg around any SACs or, or MCZ type features. Failure to agree um, project design. So again, uh, this can have knock-on effects where the design process evolves. It requires additional time and effort to undertake those assessments. You may also need to be in a position where you might need to take additional uh, survey, which you've not accommodated early in the process. And when it comes to the submission uh, consenting stage, you've missed the opportunity. Uh, early identification of your relevant data sources. So again, essential to get those data requests in as early on in the process as possible. It can take days, weeks, and you know, the onset of coronavirus now, even months before that data is returned for analysis. Engagement, early engagement with stakeholders. Um, it's a good one to you know, get them on board as early as possible. You'll alleviate any, um, you'll, you'll identify any concerns and incorporate that into your assessment and, and baseline characterization. Uh, also, if you do come across the need to undertake survey, um, then there are a number of constraints. That this this is only a short list. There are any any number of, of constraints, but vessel availability. You know, finding a suitable vessel. Um, good to contact um, uh, fishermen's federations for that purpose, particularly if you're you know needing to mirror commercial techniques. Um, procurement of uh, consents and permissions, so dispensation to use undersized mesh can take time. You've got to liaise with the relevant ICAs. Um, repeat survey aspects, so there's a seasonal component for uh, spatial and temporal considerations of so spring, winter, uh, usually. Um, tidal, so when working in intertidal areas, um, obviously you want to usually want to pick a, a spring tide to sample over and turnaround time. So um, there's a technical reporting component associated with fish and shellfish, but also if you're looking at benthic ecology, for example, sample processing. So you know that can be again weeks to months. So moving on, what are my thoughts on round four? So round three versus round four, we've heard about round three. So what are the differences? So Key factors for consideration uh, will include uh, engineering and associated infrastructure uh, predominantly. Um, round four turbine arrays are anticipated to be in mainly deeper water, so we're talking greater than 50 meters. They're going to mainly use uh, larger uh, 10 plus megawatt turbines. Uh, and their foundations may vary. So the, the, you know, the, there are options to incorporate the tra traditional um, foundations, monopiles, jackets, gravity bases, et cetera. But also because we're in deeper water now, there's gonna be a, a floating component. Um, this is quite a limited technique um, and it's, it looks like it's gonna be coming online uh, very shortly. Uh, and this will include uh, options such as semi submersible platforms, spar boys, tension legs, et cetera. Um, but from this, from this respect, with it being located further offshore, there is a, there's an element of um, what assemblages you're going to need to consider. Being round three, there are some offshore components, but it's more inshore waters. In offshore, you've got more of an adult component. So again, factoring that into the baseline and working up the need for the survey might be might be worth considering. Also, the cable export route. The further offshore you go, the longer the export route is going to be. So there is more uh, opportunity for that to conflict with shellfish uh, potting grounds, for example, or pre-existing constraints, infrastructure, uh, or um, protected areas, NCZs. So how are we gonna assess round four? Well, how do I think it's gonna be assessed? Well, most of the guidance materials are still uh, applicable. Um, I'm sure some of that some is being applied and updated uh, in, it's in the pipeline but there are also more additional um, guidance to come um there is likely to be it's a wealth of, of 
pre-existing data that's out there either for um, uh, specific targeted survey work, monitoring work undertaken by the regulators or from uh, pre-existing EIA type uh, development works that we can draw upon to, uh, to characterize and undertake a, a robust baseline. But it is worth noting uh, that particularly from a fish and shellfish perspective, um, the industry standard uh, sensitivity maps produced by Quartal uh, and Ellis uh, 1998 and 2012 are old, you know, they're, they're aging. So there may be a, a, a component for, for update. Um, where update is needed, it could be established as a, as a gap in knowledge necessitating the need for survey. And also, there's going to be a great emphasis on the cumulative and in combination effects for offshore wind, particularly now that there are you know, multiple developments out there. Um, and with the onset of round four, that's going to increase. So how is that going to be? Uh, how are those cumulative effects going to, going to happen? So you've got operational joint construction and operation versus operation and ultimately decommissioning. So just briefly for, for the, uh, the round four aspect, again, same raft of, of potential effects, underwater noise, EMF, uh, suspended sediment concentrations, habitat disturbances, et cetera. Assessment source, mainly through modeling, published data, uh, published literature, and also essentially survey, although the need for that is yet to be fully determined. But mitigation, well, mitigation again, a lot of it's going to be inherent design, so we've touched upon EMF uh, and cable burial, for example. Um, but underwater noise, um, although the, the turbines are going to be floating, there may still be a component of piling that is needed for the, the anchor, the mooring points. Um, and in that sense, traditionally, say it's been um, percussive piling, noisy um, aspects, so they've used, there's been seasonal constraints applied, there's been uh, need for active mitigation, bubble curtains, soft start, etc. Um, but there is now a, a new, again, innovative technology being developed called blue piling. And blue piling, uh, rather than being a, a, an impact form of uh, piling, uh, it instead uses a, a steel ram, uh, which is uh, in a uh, sorry, steel ram is a, a conventional form of piling, but instead a blue piling will use a, a column of water which is pushed up by a, a mixed gas. And then the action of this water falling back down by the force of gravity uh, will essentially strike the pile and deliver the percussive force that's needed to, to insert that pile. This actually benefits the infrastructure because it minimizes the fatigue on the, on the structure itself. Uh, and obviously um, massively reduces the, the noise component. Um, also, within near salt waters, particularly um, where you've got habitat loss, uh, it's worth noting that potentially you can offset that down. So where, where mitigation may not ultimately work within the marine environment, um, it may be possible to offset that net loss by looking at areas outside of your development area and considering rewilding options, something again that RSK is, is really looking into, uh, it's quite an exciting prospect, um, and seagrass being one of those options as well. And then some recent research um, that's gone on um, that, that is a useful source of, uh, of update for, the, for round four. Um, in particular, um, the the Greer 2020 uh, report. Um, it's given some absolutely fantastic illustrations. One example is, is shown there. Um, but it essentially uh, outlines the view on artificial reef effect. So by installing your, your turbines, you're essentially creating this uh, artificial structure and environment, which creates a, a reef. Um, and by doing so, um, the, the uh, you create the stepping stone effect, which has a connectivity um, to artificial hard substrata to other areas uh, and other developments and other wind farms. 
Uh, and this has been shown to have a knock-on effect by providing uh, you know, things like increased food resources, refuge areas, which can then be exploited by uh, other fish, uh, seabirds, marine mammals, hydrotrophic levels. This can then seed other areas. So you get spillover effect um, and where in a sense that you may not be able to undertake commercial fishing activities within the turbine array itself, it actually benefits the area on the outside by trawling um, and, and increasing stock abundance outside those areas. Also, the, um, the NIRAS and the SMRU report, uh, which you can see referenced there, 2019, goes into a little bit more detail and explains it a lot better than what I did about the, the blue piling technique. That's worth, uh, worth a, a look. So future applications uh, and what, you know, what does the, how are we, uh, how are we going to progress this, you know, beyond, beyond wind farms? Well, um, Norway is, uh, has just committed to uh, powering two of its offshore oil and gas assets, which are the Sol uh, Seagafax and the Snor uh, North Sea oil and gas platforms, and that will be they will be powered by floating offshore wind turbines, uh, and that was announced in January 21. Uh, it's also estimated that you know there's over 80 percent of the world's uh, resources are in are in deep water, so greater than than 50 meters. So the the develop the onset of the development of of flow in this sense will help harness that resource on a on a global scale, uh, and that can be seen by the commitment and development from uh, wider European nations, as well as internationally, such as uh, South Africa, USA, South America, uh, East Asia, and Australia to, to develop flow. Uh, and the USA has committed uh, to invest in its biggest decarbonization, decarbonization program uh, this year. Um, and that will be done via offshore wind. The UK, obviously, as we've we've touched upon, um, is also you know at, at the forefront of developing a, a flow component, um, and particularly uh, in the Celtic Sea. Again, through releases uh, recently on the Crown Estate um, website, um, Celtic Sea seems to be at the forefront at the moment. Obviously, there's that um, the component in the northeast as well, in the in the North Sea, for for flow to take place, and then hydrogen. So. Hydrogen could be the next big thing. Um, obviously, there are a lot of North Sea oil and gas assets that are in an aging condition. Uh, the commercial viability is under question. And what do we do with those platforms where we can decommission more together and remove the infrastructure? Uh, but some might say that's a bit of a timely and costly process. So instead, um, we can look to flow to power those infrastructure uh, assets and repurpose them. Uh, and by doing so, they can essentially use uh, offshore wind um, to power the electro electrolysis process to create fresh water, um, which in turn can be split and produce hydrogen, which will you know, power, uh, power uh, fuel cells for cars and the uh, at heating, etc., so becomes endless essentially. So, offshore wind has got a lot of uh, a lot of future potential, and I think going forward, um, particularly with with the likes of flow and hydrogen, they're the two biggest components that I uh, that I look forward to uh, seeing develop in the near future. And I think that about concludes my talk for today. So, I'd like to thank you all for listening, uh, and I would welcome the opportunity to take any questions. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, yeah, that's a whistle stop bit through uh, the world of, of wind power and uh, in the marine environment. Quite a few questions. I'm going to kick off with, let me just look. Will the use of floating turbines reduce the effects on fish and shellfish species and habitats? Some questions. So um, I think that. As they're floating, um, there is obviously a component that is, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be as, as potentially difficult, as, as impactful as uh, traditional um, 
uh, turbine array is going to be installed. But as I say, there are there's the components there by um, you know, the, the piles that are going to have to go in. There's going to have to be a, a an anchoring mechanism somehow. So, so no, there is still going to be a, a, a commitment to um, assess those floating aspects and how that's going to be um, how it's going to be done from a fish and shellfish perspective. In much the same way for, for round three, I'd imagine. Okay, thank you. Um, next one. Uh, are there any benefits to fish, well, to a fish community following the installation of an offshore wind farm? So, yeah, absolutely. So, um, in essence, when when a, a, an installation is, in, is installed, such as a, a, a turbine array, um, you can essentially you're essentially mimicking a, a protected environment whereby you're um, precluding certain forms of commercial activity so trawling for example that become exclusion zone or safety zones um, around you know, the cables of the assets in terms of the turbines itself so by that you can you can facilitate that reef effect you create a, a seeding um, component and then that will create a spillover effect um, and that will then benefit the wider regional areas Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is a silly one. Um, oh, there was a serious question. Is this bit. As fish are so mo mobile, isn't the temporary nature of noise, noise disturbance just a red herring? <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. So um, the mobility of fish is, is, a, is a big one, but obviously where the construction period and the number of uh, turbines that are going to be installing, sometimes it's in, in the order of, you know, hundreds uh, and construction can take uh, months and it's not possible to install all of those at, at any one time so where you've got um uh, generation of excessive underwater noise over a several month period or, or kind of a, over an intermittent basis um, and you've got those seasonal components associated with particularly migratory fish or spawning it can have a you know knock-on effect in terms of behavioural and also um, a physical injury effect if, if it's you know situated close to areas of sensitivity. Okay, um, next one here is it's quite a broad one, I guess, but it's something that, that I know that bothers uh, terrestrial ecologists as well is how do you define the zone of influence? Uh, so yeah, so the zone of influence um, again can be taken from you know the footprint of the array, the export cable route itself, uh, and then extrapolate that up. So you would then look at what effects that's going to have. So as mentioned, you've got modelling um, in the in the immediate uh, uh, area, um, you would look at sort of areas of, sort of lethality or sediment plume, um, and you would take that as your sort of primary zone of influence. Uh, you'd overlay that with again spawning nursery refuge areas etc and then uh, work your way up so where those those boundaries start to 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 um uh, to i can't remember I can't really think of the word but where it, where it kind of deviates out i suppose that becomes the the wider the study area mm -hmm. okay uh just looking through the list here um is post-construction monitoring routinely carried out as in, I think the point of this, I suppose, would be that um, uh, the evidence based, the sort of feedback loop into best practice, is that is it done and then learned from? Yeah, I mean, certain aspects of it, and I'm not sure if it's if it's, if it's a routine um, component or not. There was there was, as far as I'm aware, from, from the developments I've been involved in, maybe not necessarily the demonstrator projects, but. Um, for, for round three, there was some elements of um, monitoring that would have would have been undertaken. That might not necessarily be just for fish and shellfish, but for other components, for other uh, areas, um, benthic marine mammal, etc. That that may have been a consideration, and also for, for birds as well. So bird strike was a was a big one, um, and also uh, from invasive species, so biofowl as well. So we mentioned the sort of the stepping stone effect, but from an invasive species aspect of it. They can act as seeding grounds as well. Again, so where you've where traditionally you want to have hard substrate, uh, you essentially introduce a new hard structure, and they can you know prog uh, propagate from one to the other. So uh, there there have been studies to monitor for for invasive fire fire bio, bio, Okay, we'll probably have a time for a couple more. Um, 
Wind obviously is the direction of travel, but what are other what other technologies are being developed? From a an energy sense. I guess so, a renewable energy sense, yeah. A renewable energy sense. So yeah, there's uh, obviously wind is a, is a big one. That's that's the kind of the, the primary commitment from the from the UK government at the moment. Um, it was a few years ago. Wave and tidal energy uh, were were the buzzword. So, um, but they see, they seem to unfortunately have been pretty much canned uh, for the moment. They uh, there was initial talk of uh, of barrages and things like the seven barrage was was a big one, and um, that got kicked back into sort of the public sector. And then um, the the tidal lagoon concept came about, which I thought was a was a, was a better idea, is less of a of an impact. But sadly, again, um, that that kind of uh, for a time being has been has been parked. But um, I think that being an island nation such as we are, with a, with a huge tidal range, um, I think it's only a matter of time really before the wave and tidal aspects will will kick back in and that become commercially viable at some point. Okay, well, let's hope so. Um, okay, perhaps we take this as the last one. Um, Hi Matthew, really interesting talk, thank you. I work as a marine mammal observer and have worked on a project using bubble curtain to minimise piling noise in the North Sea. Is this suitable mitigation for fish also? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Bubble curtains have been a you know, proven technology for, for fish. Um, it essentially uh, acts as a, as, as a screen as it would do for, for marine mammals. So um, particularly for species that are noise sensitive, so herring being one of them, they, they there's evidence to show that they don't cross that boundary so if you can set that up in such a, a way that you're going to exclude them from encountering that, that prospect also there's a, there's a sound dampening aspect to it as well so it might not necessarily completely stop sound propagation beyond that point but it will also mitigate it to it to an extent okay great thanks matthew um i think we'll probably bring it to a close now uh, thanks everybody um again for for attending today and for, for asking questions and, and getting involved. I hope you've all enjoyed that as, as much as I have. Um, last thing I need to say really is just to say that um, next uh, next month, the first Thursday Club is a highlight in the calendar because um, it's me talking. Um, so let's see how many attendees we get for that. No, the, I'm gonna be talking about the bird survey guidelines, um, uh, which are newly emerging. Um, so if that's something that, I was going to say floats your boat, but after that last talk, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, then, yeah, please attend that. Um, yeah, I just want everybody to have a, have a great Easter break. And uh, we remind you to fill in the questionnaire when it, when it comes around after with the email. Um, but yeah, apart from that, we'll see you next month. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matthew. Cheers, no problem.